quite accomplished, actually, in the way that he is able to, has been thinking in terms of probabilistic reasoning and Bayes' theorem in particular. Uh, many of you may know this, but he uh, had a debate with Peter Atkins not too long ago about the existence of God, and uh, I would say did quite marvelous in beating him, which I think is quite an accomplishment. Um, and also, to his credit, he has uh, published an article that is coming out in a very fine journal about Bayesian reasoning with regards uh, in philosophy of religion. So don't, do not let his age fool you. He um, is, has quite uh, a bit of accomplishment and things to say about these matters. Um, so I'll turn this over to Calum, and then we'll be having some short presentations from others as well. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate it might be kind of the last day of the conference. You might be a bit weary and everything. Uh, but it's good to have uh, more than I expected turning out. So thanks a lot for coming, and I hope you find it useful. Uh, so I'm going to start just by introducing kind of the relevant concepts, um, just to give kind of a broad overview of the topic, and then we'll talk in detail about more of these things as we go through, um, as we have the other presentations uh, and we have the panel discussion. So we're basically going to be talking today about the probability of the resurrection. Um, and this is probably kind of a daunting way to kind of suddenly step in, especially if you're not used to probabilistic reasoning and the tools of probability um, before. But I'm hopefully going to make it more palatable to begin with. Um, so this is what's called Bayes' theorem. Um, and Bayes' theorem is a useful way of understanding how probability um, plays out when we think about evidence and when we think about hypotheses and how evidence confirms hypotheses and theories. Um, and so I'm just going to break it down to explain it. So this, this top line, so the first section of that means the probability of H given E and K. Um, and what we want to do when we think about a theory is we want to know how probable is the theory given all the evidence we have. And so the ultimate probability we want to be calculating is the probability of our theory or hypothesis H given E, all the evidence we have, and K which is background knowledge. Um, and that's kind of more general data we have about the world. Uh, and one way to calculate this is to begin with what we have on the right-hand side at the top, the probability of H given K. This is kind of the general probability of a hypothesis before we look at the evidence. And then what we do is we keep adding new evidence sequentially to see how does the evidence affect the probability of the hypothesis. And so if we look at the middle term there, we have the probability of ev the evidence given the hypothesis over the probability of the evidence just on its own. And all of these are relative to background knowledge. And what we can see from this is, if the middle factor is more than one, then the probability of the hypothesis is increased relative to what it was before. Because we multiply the middle, uh, the middle factor by the right-hand factor, and if the middle factor is more than one in total, then the left-hand side will be greater than the original probability of the hypothesis. Um, and what does it mean for the middle probability to be more than one? It basically means that the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is greater than the probability of the evidence in general. And so one way to think about this is if we think about a theory predicting data, um, say that my theory predicts um, that the grass will be green, then the evidence we have is that the grass is green. The probability of that evidence given my theory is one. But the probability of the evidence in general is probably going to be less than one. And so one divided by something less than one will be in total greater than one. And so the hypothesis is confirmed by the evidence. And what we can then do is just keep adding more and more evidence. So once we have the probability of H given E and K at the side on the bottom, we can add a second piece of evidence, E2, and do the same thing. And so that's how Bayesian confirmation works. It just keeps going through sequentially uh, in that fashion. Uh, so to give another example, suppose the hypothesis is Harry is a murderer in a, in a crime case. The evidence is we find Harry's fingerprints on a gun at the crime scene. If Harry was the murderer, um, we, would ex we might expect Harry's fingerprints on a gun near the crime scene. But if he wasn't the murderer, then we wouldn't expect that evidence so much. So the middle term is greater than one because the top half is quite high and the bottom half is quite low. Uh, we multiply that by the original hypothesis and we get to by the, probab the original probability of our hypothesis and we reach the final probability of our, our hypothesis which is going to be increased from what it was before. 
Uh, a final example, this is the relevant one we're talking about today. So we want to know the probability of the resurrection given all our evidence. And what we do is we find what is called a prior probability of the resurrection on the right hand side. And then we multiply that by the relevant evidence uh, factor there. And we think how much does the evidence increase the probability of the resurrection. Uh, and we hope that it will increase it uh, overall to something more than one. And so the left hand probability is what we really want to be finding out. The probability of the resurrection given the evidence. So, just to give a brief overview of what evidence there is and what we'll be talking about, um, there's the kind of classical evidence that people would point to in defending a case for the resurrection. So these are things like the evidence regarding the empty tomb on the Sunday morning, uh, the evidence uh, with respect to the appearances to the disciples, uh, so Jesus appearing on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appearing to 500 and so on. Um, the evidence regarding the rise of early Christianity and certain uh, mutations in Jewish thoughts that arose um, in early Christianity. Uh, and N.T. Wright's written a lot about that. Um, and evidence about biblical scholarship in general. So these are the more specific pieces of evidence we have in the case of the resurrection. But there's also some relevant background knowledge which we have. Uh, and this is also important in coming to a final probability. And some of this evidence includes our background knowledge about Jesus' ministry and claims. So the religious context of Jesus' ministry, uh, the claims he apparently made about himself are going to be relevant to the overall probability. And questions about the authenticity of those claims, for example, to messiahship or to divinity, uh, will affect the probability of the resurrection. There's also background knowledge regarding competing religious claims. So the plausibility of other religions, for example, or other claims to be prophets from God uh, will also affect the probability. And there's background knowledge regarding Jewish prophecy. So things like Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and other messianic prophecies will also be relevant to making a case for the resurrection. Now, some people will think that those aren't very plausible, but they should at least be factored into the overall calculation. Now, and there's also background knowledge of natural theology. So this all takes place in the context of what other evidence we have for religious claims in general or theistic claims. How much independent evidence is there for a God of the kind that might be likely to raise Jesus from the dead? And so that's some of the relevant evidence we're going to be talking about. Now, one of the challenges here is uh, um, a position that's recently become popular in the philosophy of religion known as sceptical theism. Um, and what sceptical theism says is basically that we don't really have very good knowledge of the kinds of good and evils that there are in the world. Um, we only have a limited knowledge of the range of goods and evils in the world, and actually there might not be very more. So this might seem to be a threat to an argument for the resurrection, because if the original probability of the resurrection depends on what God would be likely to do if God existed, um, would we expect God to become incarnate, for example, or to raise Jesus from the dead? If we don't really have much knowledge about the range of goods and evils in the world, then it seems that we might not be able to say much about how likely it is that God would do such a thing. And so this seems to be, at least prima facie, a threat to arguments for the resurrection. Uh, and John's going to be talking a little bit about that later. Um, so some of the some more things we're going to be talking about today and discussing. Uh, I mentioned the middle factor, which is kind of the probability of the evidence given the resurrection uh, relative to the probability of the evidence in general. And if we want to say that the resurrection happened, what we'll want to say here is that that bottom factor is very low and the top factor is at least moderately high. Um, and so we want to be asking how powerful is the evidence for the empty tomb and the appearances to the disciples? Did the woman on the Sunday morning really find an empty tomb and so on? And how can we know this? And also how powerful is the evidence of the empty tomb and the appearances to the disciples? Uh, how, if we assume that the empty tomb uh, was indeed empty, and that uh, the disciples did indeed have appearances of a bodily risen Jesus, how much does that affect the probability of the resurrection? How good evidence is that? Um, and what about alternative hypotheses that it could explain those, such as hallucinations? And so questions related to this factor in the middle are the value of testimonial evidence in general, and a fair bit has been written about that. Um, things to do with the general authenticity of the Gospels, and so there's obviously a huge amount of literature about that, uh, spanning centuries and centuries. Um, but some recent things which have been given a probabilistic analysis, or at least seem very um, uh, amenable to probabilistic analysis, include arguments from undesigned coincidences, um, arguments from silence. So, you know, why did uh, Tacitus not mention Jesus more if he was so influential and so on? Things like that. These things can be given probabilistic analyses. Um, 
There's also the question of the explanatory paucity of the resurrection, um, which has been talked about recently by Kevin and Colin Betty. And what they say is, even though the probability of the evidence in general um, is unlikely, we wouldn't expect to find the empty tomb, etc. It's not clear that the resurrection does a particularly good job of explaining it. So we might not, for example, expect Paul to be converted if Jesus was resurrected. Um, so there's questions there about how well the resurrection explains those facts. Um, even if we assume that the competing hypotheses don't explain them well. Uh, and there's also the question of alternative explanations. Uh, the factor on the right is the prior probability of the resurrection, and this is before we look at the detailed evidence about the empty tomb and appearances, how probable is the resurrection. Um, there are questions here about how we can evaluate that kind of probability, and a lot of people are very skeptical that this can be done at all. Um, and indeed, Hume's argument attacks here. So Hume's argument says, no matter what the evidence is in the middle that confirms the resurrection, um, because the resurrection is so improbable kind of in itself, uh, no amount of evidence can be sufficient to establish that the resurrection was overall probable. Now, Hume didn't frame it in those uh, technical probabilistic terms, but people have given, um, have given probabilistic renderings of Hume's argument, which uh, basically show that it amounts to that kind of argument. Um, it can be shown that this probability actually depends on a variety of factors again. Um, and these factors include how likely is it that God exists, given the evidence of natural theology. How likely is it that God would raise Jesus from the dead if God existed? Uh, and what reasons can we have for thinking that God might want to do such a thing? Um, this latter question depends on detailed factors about Jesus' life and his ministry and his claims, um, his teachings and his actions. Uh, and so all those things will be relevant to determining how likely, how likely it is that God would raise Jesus from the dead if God existed. Um, so if Jesus was just a random person who didn't do anything particularly significant in his life, we might consider it generally improbable that God would raise him from the dead. But if, for example, Jesus uh, made prophetic claims, um, performed miracles, healed people, um, and saw himself as, uh, as sent from God, and if he predicted his resurrection, then that will obviously play some role uh, in showing that God might want to raise Jesus from the dead. Um, and finally, it also depends on God's motivations for becoming incarnate in the first place or of sending a prophet similar to Jesus. Um, and so Richard Swinburne has talked a lot about this in his writing, uh, saying that God has very good reason to become incarnate. Um, and so we should expect kind of an incarnate God with reasonable probability. Um, and the factors that go into that will be, will be relevant to establishing a final probability as well. Um, and so we can ignore this middle section, this bit here for the time being, I won't go into detail because of time. Um, but this is basically elaborating what the prior probability is and showing how it breaks down into other factors. Um, this one in particular shows how theism plays into it. Uh, but I won't go into that into detail. But again, these fact the same factors are relevant to establishing that probability. Um, finally, we might want to talk a little bit about auxiliary evidence for Christianity. So um, the kind of traditional classical evidence for the resurrection is the historical evidence to do with Jesus' teaching and his um, purported resurrection and the appearances and so on. But a lot of people who have uh, talked about uh, other independent pieces of evidence, uh, such as the Lord Liar or Lunatic argument, originally given by C.S. Lewis, um, but talked about more recently by Stephen T. Davis. And this is basically the argument that Given the improbability of Jesus being either deceitful or mad or otherwise mistaken, um, it seems probable that Jesus was God, given the claims he made about himself. And this will play into the probability. Uh, people have also argued for cr Christianity given its moral teaching. Um, some have said that it, the radicalness of the moral teaching of Jesus uh, is evidence that it wouldn't come from, uh, from a human teacher, or at least is some kind of some clue uh, that it doesn't come from a human teacher. Um, others have said that Christianity is one of the few good bases for human rights, for example, and so that might be seen as some evidence for Christianity. Uh, I mentioned before that prophecy will be, um, will be relevant, and Lydia McGrew has a recent paper giving a probabilistic analysis of how probability plays into it, uh, but that is something that could be explored more. And others have suggested that the beautiful narrative of Christianity, the incarnation um, and redemption, is something that isn't... Uh, a huge part of other religions and isn't quite as beautiful or aesthetically or existentially fulfilling as it is in Christianity. And so some have said that this is evidence for Christianity. Uh, and there might be other pieces of evidence we have for Christianity. Um, so this is just an example, you might not be able to see it very well. This is how you can 
put all the propositions together. So this is just an Excel spreadsheet I made. Um, I obviously have far too much time. Um, <laughs> but I did this yesterday, and basically what I have here is the probability of the resurrection um, given the evidence we have, and obviously there are a lot of calculations in determining that, and I haven't factored in everything by any means. Um, but this is just the probability of the resurrection given background knowledge, and it comes to a probability which um, I basically made up because I didn't have time to really think about it. But you can see how the propositions link together, and that, that can be a useful way of doing it. So just to, to finish off, uh, this, this workshop was suggested um, because John Depo and I are thinking about a book volume, which we already have contributors who have agreed to, to write a chapter for this book. And this is going to be exploring these things in more detail. So just a quick whiz through the outline of content, so I won't talk about all the chapters. Um, but it will begin with an introduction. It will talk about a general case for the resurrection and how these things fit together. And that will be with Richard Swinburne and Michael Tooley um, discussing that. Uh, there'll be some general factors to consider in probability and the resurrection. Um, so, for example, uh, let's take Trent Doherty's uh, paper. We'll be talking about what the numbers mean, how we can assign numerical um, figures to these kinds of probabilities. Um, we'll talk about the probability of the resurrection given theism. So that's to do with the prior probability of the resurrection. And Stephen Davis, for example, talking about whether God would um, want there to be miracles in general. Um, Kenny Boyce. Um, is talking about whether sceptical theists can endorse arguments for the resurrection. Um, and then there'll be a, an assessment of how the evidence plays into that. Um, so Evan Fales, for example, will be talking about Tim and Lydia McGrew's paper in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Um, David Glass will be talking about whether the evidence for the resurrection can be explained away. And it, this will be a section basically looking at uh, how the evidence affects the probability and how good the evidence is. And throughout the book, we have a variety of Christians and non-Christians contributing to this. Um, and we think it will be something that will be um, hopefully a good contribution <laughs> to the literature. We don't have any kind of contract or agreement with any publishers as of yet, but that's kind of the general plan. Um, so something that John and I are quite excited about. If, if you have any close connections, we would be happy for you to work those in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, I mean, I have kind of some other stuff on more, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I have kind of more detail on each of the points I've mentioned. I won't talk about those there. Um, but now I'll just kind of leave it open to the other contributors. Um, and I think we're going to begin with Richard Swinburne. Um, but thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs>